folks. My name is Josh Dobson. I currently serve in the State House representing Avery, Mitchell, and McDowell counties. Uh, I've served as chair of the Health Policy Committee and over the budget appropriations process this last session. I've always tried to govern an approach that tries to bring people together, and that's not just rhetoric for me. That's the way I've tried to govern. Any bill I filed, I tried to have both Republicans and Democrats on that bill. When I think my party is right, I do things that I agree with my party on. If I think my party is wrong, then I do the opposite of that. For instance, Medicaid expansion, Carolina Cares is something that I've supported in the past. Uh, so I'm not afraid to be my own man and do the things that I think are right. And I think that's especially needed in the Labor Department where that position should be nonpartisan because it shouldn't matter what the political labels are. The job is to keep the employees of North Carolina safe. That's the same approach I'll bring to the Department of Labor. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. So let me ask you about that because, you know, as an editorial board, we've been um, sometimes critical of the current labor commissioner. We've uh, said that she may have looked out a little bit too much for businesses and maybe not enough for workers. Um, do you disagree with that assessment? What, do you, what kind of job do you think she's done? I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to criticize my opponent. I haven't at any time and I'm not going to start and I'm, I'm not going to second guess someone who's been there. I'll just say from my, my perspective, uh, I, would, I think each case needs to be looked at individually. And when there is egregious things that have been done, that, those employers should be held accountable. But I think each case needs to be done on its individual basis. In addition to that, something that I would like to, to look at uh, improving at the Department of Labor is is wage enforcement. Uh, I don't know if it's more employees are needed or we need to fill the vacancies that we've had, but I think those need to be handled expeditiously and fairly. So that's something else that I would look at that I would want to bring to a new administration at the Department of Labor. So talk about what kind of professional experience you have, whether it's at the, in the House or otherwise, that would uh, inform you as, as the next Labor Commissioner. So I have served in elected office for 10 years, county commissioner for two years in McDowell County, and then eight years at the General Assembly. And I've worked on many issues, particularly as the full budget chair uh, of appropriations and working on labor issues, funding issues for the department. But I think my experience is unique in a way that I have been able to work with whomever is at the table. One example of that is when we, got managed care done for the Medicaid population in North Carolina. Uh, we had a final piece to that. I sat down with the governor's office. I sat down with the Senate and figured out what everybody could live with, what they could live without. And we got managed care signed by Governor Cooper. In addition to that, he, his administration asked for 100 million more in testing, 20 million more in child care, and we were able to get that done. So. I think my unique approach is one that can bring employers and employees and all stakeholders to the table to figure out what the right policy is. That's what I've done in the General Assembly and that's what I'll do at the Department of Labor. So I, I did a, a brief glance of, of your legislative record, at least for the last year. And so, so you're going to need to fill in some details before that. Um, I saw a couple of places where you voted to protect farms and employers. Uh, the ag-gag bill would be one of them. Um, but I didn't see really any legislation that you introduced or voted yes on that would protect workers. What am I missing from the, from the nine years before that? Yeah, th thank you for the question. One bill that I, that I sponsored uh, with bipartisan support and got it through the House, the Senate, and signed into law, had to do with nurses working in the nursing profession. We had an issue where when nurses were assaulted in the emergency room, they didn't have the same protections as if they were assaulted in some er other area of the hospital. Uh, working with all the stakeholders, Democrats and Republicans, we were able to get that bill through the House and the Senate and signed by I think it was Governor Cooper, or Governor McCrory at that time, but it was on a bipartisan basis uh, to protect hardworking nurses. So that's one example of where I've tried my best to, to protect the workers of North Carolina. Ned, do you have questions? Yes, Josh, you voted, I presume, for HB2, correct? I did, I did vote for House Bill 2, correct. And that contained a requirement that uh, overrode any locality's ability to set a minimum wage, right? 
were you supportive of that idea that the local counties and cities couldn't set their own minimum wage? For, just to clarify, for, for contractors? Just a, it's a countywide minimum wage, but they would have, everybody had to pay a minimum wage. <laughs> So there was a lot in House Bill 2, and I would have to go back and look at that. I, I was thinking that it was they could not require contractors to pay a minimum wage, not for the local government itself. But I'll be honest with you, I'd have to go back and check that. Uh, I, I certainly would not be opposed if a local government wanted to decide to do that uh, for their employees. That's, that's certainly their right. I would want to ask more questions if we're talking about those that contract with local governments, that would be something that I'd need to take a deeper dive at uh, for clarification. But the whole issue of local governments paying minimum wage, I, I, I would definitely defer that to them. And if I could go further just quickly, uh, at the state level, I, as, a, as chair of appropriations, I was pushing for a $15 minimum wage for state employees. Uh, and that was signed by Governor Cooper and as a full chair, I took the lead in that and was glad that uh, we could get support on that and got it passed. Governor Cooper, you mentioned he, he did try to put through an executive order to do something about, you know, protecting people working in meatpacking plants and poultry plants. They've been deemed essential workers, mm -hmm. but they've been exposed to a lot of COVID in these, these settings. And, uh, Labor commissioner sort of said, this really is beyond our jurisdiction. We can't do anything about these working conditions in there. That's a federal issue. Uh, can you do something for these people that are working in the difficult circumstances like that? So I, I did take a look at that document. It, uh, it was 20 pages long, so it was quite extensive. Uh, there are things in there that I would welcome working with the governor on to, to get done. Uh, for instance, having migrant workers required to wear a mask inside a building with others or within six feet of another person, uh, prohibiting employers from firing or retaliating against workers who are required to stay home from work because of COVID-19. That is something that I would, I would strongly want to work with Governor Cooper on to see if we could, we could work with Governor Cooper and the business community and employers to get that done. Some other things in there uh, were a little bit more problematic for me. For instance, six feet of social distancing during transportation. That, that would be a tough one. I don't see that as being feasible. Uh, and using tents for worker separation during a COVID outbreak. I don't know how that would be something that could be feasible. So a document as a whole, there are things I could get behind, but I always try to be on the level with whoever I'm talking to. There were some things I just don't know how we would have been able to enforce. Mm -hmm. What's your position on family leave? Should we have that statewide that people should be able to leave for illnesses or maternity leave, that kind of thing? So just to clarify, you're not talking about family medical leave. You're talking about the executive order with uh, paid family leave. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I've thought a lot about that. I, w I would just say that I would strongly consider it. And I'm not hedging. I just would have some more questions to ask. But I would strongly consider it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we, in the state of North Carolina, it is hard to recruit, whether it's investigators or inspectors at the Labor Department, whatever it may be, it is hard to recruit the best and the brightest because they can make more money in the private sector. So anything we can use as a tool to bring in more, the, more of the best and the brightest uh, I would certainly look at it and paid parental leave based on the executive order is one of those things. So I would strongly consider it. Mm -hmm. When he was governor, Pat McCory talked a lot about, you know, there was sort of a stubborn unemployment problem because a lot of businesses needed people, but they didn't, they couldn't find people that were adequately trained for the type of work that they needed, you know, these high tech businesses and that kind of thing. Can you do anything to sort of close what they call the skills gap in terms of the workforce? Yeah, the, the, the Labor Department doesn't have direct jurisdiction there, but you can use the platform of labor to advocate for that. And I think the community colleges have to play a role in that. I've, uh, I've seen where the community colleges have partnered with, in my district, whether it be Baxter's that makes IV solution bags or Westrock that makes 
Chick-fil-A boxes. Uh, they have been able to partner to train those employees in a way that is beneficial to the college, to the employee, and to the business at hand. So I would certainly welcome using the platform of labor to advocate for the community college system, advocate for better collaboration between those to make sure employees are have those necessary skills that they need. You know, there's been a lot of complaints about the current office and that you know, complaints come in, they're not acted on. <laughs> and uh, whether that's for lack of inspectors or resources or whether they, they don't particularly care or they discount things immediately. But, would you go in and look back at some of the, the backlog there and review whether all these complaints did get sufficient attention and maybe take some action on them? So I would certainly look at any case. Uh, so, the, so the short answer is I would be happy to, to go back and look as things come up and have those things investigated. Uh, again, one, one area that I would want to focus on specifically, obviously accidents and I'm not, not, that has to be at the top of the list to make sure the employees of North Carolina are safe. And I will do everything in my power to make sure those things are investigated, to make sure that they're done right. And then uh, if there's egregious things that take place, that those, are, those are, that need to be held accountable are held accountable. In addition to that, something that, that, that has always been something that's been near and dear to my heart, because coming from where I come from, people, every dollar counted every dollar counts. And if someone is not being paid what they say they're supposed to be paid, I would take that very seriously. And I would look at every one of those to make sure that the Labor Department, and I used every resource that the Labor Department had to make sure that those employees were paid what they are supposed to be paid. And again, when I talk about collaboration, that's not just rhetoric. I have a relationship with Josh Stein and Jim O'Neill. And whomever's at the attorney general's office, you have to work closely with on those things because that's who in the end would be handling those cases. But you can rest assured, I would make a strong recommendation where I see that someone's not been paid what they were supposed to be paid. I would do all I could to make sure that was the case. So looking back, I would certainly look back and see uh, where things need to be corrected. As things happen in the future, we need to hold people accountable for the most egregious things. And then when it comes to wage enforcement, I would use every tool and every resource at the Labor Department to make sure people were paid what they're supposed to be paid. I don't know if you recall the, uh, the series, the News and Observer did a few years back about contract payment, and that so many employers were labeling really full-time employees as contractors in order to get around paying them benefits and meeting some of the you know, fair wage requirements and making them, uh, you know, providing unemployment compensation, some of the things that come with being a full-time employee. Uh, can you fix that at all? Or is this pattern of sort of calling your employees contractors uh, something we're just got to live with? Yeah, I've, I've looked into that and, and there, there's more rules than there are state law on that. Back in 2017, uh, I think it was, was Representative Pen Pendleton at the time, or there were those who, he, he kind of took the initiative there, from, there in Wake County uh, to make sure that people were classified accordingly. And there was a bill passed that uh, give the Industrial Commission some authority over misclassifications. So even though the Labor Department doesn't have, you know, specific oversight or jurisdiction, they do have a relationship with the Industrial Commission, and I would certainly want to do that. I'll tell you where the Labor Department would have a role to play in this. If, if someone files a worker's comp claim, and then they feel, whether a contractor or not, they feel that because they filed that claim, that in the, in the future they were retaliated against for filing that worker's comp claim, that's when the Labor Department has a role to play. And I would definitely uh, take that very, very seriously because that is in statute and that is direct oversight from the Labor Department, and I would take it very seriously. Well, we've asked you a lot about you know, what you would do on behalf of workers. But of course, you got two roles there. You have to serve business as well. So anything you would do to improve the department's relationship with business or services or services it provides to business owners? I, I, Ned, I just, I just plan to be fair. And again, that's not just rhetoric for me. That's the way I've governed. And I think both Republicans and Democrats in the General Assembly 
would tell you that's the approach I've taken. And that's the same approach I'll take when it comes to when my wage enforcement investigators are making their case, I'm going to set a tone of fairness for both employers and employees. That's the way I've governed. And that's exactly the same way I'll, I'll govern if I'm fortunate enough to be the next commissioner of labor in North Carolina. What do you think about the council of state? There's been some complaints about they're not listened to enough. That they should be conferred with more. They should have a bigger role with the, you know, kind of the governor just sort of usurps a lot of the authority. Would you sort of try to get more involved with that council aspect of, of being a statewide elected office? I would start by saying we, we only have one governor and we only have one governor at a time. Uh, that's the way our constitution's set up and that's the way it is in North Carolina. Uh, as things come up and as there are votes taken on the council of state, I will take that very seriously. And I will study those issues that come up and, uh, and use that platform on the council of state. But to be clear, whether it's Dan Forrest or whether it's Roy Cooper, we only have one governor. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for the opportunity. Josh, I got one more question for you before, yes, we, before we head up. So I have a couple of stats that kind of seem a little bit contradictory and I wanna get your take on it. So last year, workplace deaths in North Carolina, uh, there were 53, which I'm sure you, you know, and that's a 25% increase and a high for the decade. And yet injury and illness rates have steadily declined over the decade. What's your take on that? Peter, I've thought a lot about that. And it does seem counterintuitive a bit to have injuries decline while death rates have, have, uh, have increased slightly. Um, I, would, I would say that, that, that's, a, that that's an interesting, interesting thing to see that. Uh, I, I think that, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why why there's a contradiction there. Why why because your 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 stats are exactly right uh, because I've studied them myself and death rates have went up and injuries have declined uh, and that's something that uh, I would have to put some more thought in as to why that is. I uh, I just I grieve I grieve any death in North Carolina. Uh, we've had several last year at the Department of Corrections. And as you probably know, I put myself through school, undergraduate and graduate, as an employee of the Department of Corrections in North Carolina. So that one was kind of personal to me. And I will do everything I can and listen to everyone at the table to make sure that we don't have deaths and do everything we can to make sure that every employee goes home safe. That's, that's all I can say on that one.